podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So, good morning. So, uh, in the next three lectures, uh, I'm going to tell you about techniques of topological string theory. Topological string theory was introduced by Ed Witten in uh, I think more than 20 years ago, and uh, his motivation at that time was to construct some kind of simplified toy model of string theory, from which uh, one can try to learn some lessons about uh, the actual super string theory that we would like to understand. It turns out, however, that not only topological string is actually a toy model, but it can also be used to do useful computation in superstring theory compactified on Calabria manifold. So in particular, type two superstring on four-dimensional Minkowski space times the Calabria threefold. So this is a subject that you might have already heard uh, in the past lectures of this summer school. And uh, uh, this is, of course, of the understanding this is, of course, of very importance. And uh, uh, we will talk about the case with uh, brains and with fluxes, too. So topological string is a technique, mathematical techniques, that would allow you to do certain computation uh, in a situation like this. Uh, they're doing the uh, uh, explicit computation of various low energy effective theory terms uh, in this context uh, is a very difficult task. For example, as I re very much remember when I was a graduate student uh, in mid or early 80s, uh, so, so super string revolution just happened, uh, so I was very excited and I wanted to do some computation in a situation like that, and David Gross just was visiting Japan. So I very much remember I told him my sort of research plan. And she said, that would be impossible. People would not ev does not even know the metric on Calabria space. That was his very discouraging uh, comment. And we still don't know the metric of Calabria manifold, in fact, after uh, more than 25 years. Uh, now this is, turned out to be a very difficult problem, mathematical problem. There has been some interesting progress on that recently. But, uh, but method of topological string allows you to circumvent the difficulties and allow us to do some useful computation in a situation without knowing the metric of Calabria space explicitly. So, so this is a technique that I would like to tell you about uh, 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 in these three sets of lectures. And uh, so I have divided these three lectures into three sort of small subjects. And uh, today I will basically talk, tell you about the definition and some basic properties of topological string theory. Tomorrow, well, I guess the day after tomorrow, my lecture will be, there will be two more lectures on Friday. So in the next lecture, I will tell you about various computational techniques. And I will introduce a notion of toric Calabria manifold, mirror symmetries, topological vertex, etc. in the second lecture. And in the third lecture, uh, I will tell you the connection between such uh, computation and the computation in actual superstring theory. So I will be telling you about applications. Okay. So this is the plan of my lecture. So let's begin. So, uh, so I would uh, like to basically focus on, uh, first of all, I would be considering NSR formalism. So that means that I will be using the basic variable uh, coordinate x, which maps two-dimensional surface into the target space, and then plus fermions. In, when we consider topological string, uh, I'll be ignoring the existence of the four-dimensional part for now, which would eventually mean that I'll be actually considering uh, derivative expansion, low energy expa effective theory on R3 direction. So instead, I'll be considering just a map 
from Riemann surface into Calabi-Yau manifold. And the free fermion, uh, sorry, fermions associated to that. It turns out that this system, when this target space is Calabi-Yau threefold, uh, has uh, supersymmetry on the wall sheet, actually two supersymmetry on the left and two, two supersymmetry on the right, and it is a superconformal symmetry. So it's a supersymmetric extension of the Virasoro symmetry. I had you, you had a, a lecture on introduction to superstring uh, last week, and I understand you, you know that the critical dimensions are important. For example, superstring, it's 10 dimension. This, is target, this target space is six dimensions, so it's not critical string in the sense of type two string. But it turned out that for topological string, this target space six dimension plays particularly important role, as we will see later. Okay, so we have n equal to two super, super conformal symmetry. So let me write down the generator. So super conformal algebra. By the way, uh, can you read my handwriting from all the way from the back? Okay, very good. So uh, as usual, it is decomposed into left mover and right mover. Left mover start with energy momentum tensor T and a pair of supercurrent G plus and G minus. That's why we call that as N equal to superconformal symmetry and the R current that distinguish the charge of the two. And then for the right mover, we have the same set of generator. We distinguish the right mover and the left mover by putting bars and not putting bars. This is an energy momentum tensor, so this generates the Virasoro symmetry. Uh, it has central charge C. If you look at the literature of N equal to theory, uh, you often see the notation of C hat, which is basically a third of the original central charge. Uh, it's just notation. And uh, this C hat, is related to the target dimension, complex dimension of uh, the target space M. So in particular, if target space is Calabia threefold, then C hat is equal to three, so that means that C equal nine. So, so this is actually part of the uh, wall sheet conformal field theory that one would use if we want to understand the uh, uh, string propagating in this geometry. When we try discuss string propagating in this geometry, we consider world sheet dynamic degrees of freedom, part of which maps the world sheet into Calabria part, another part maps Calabi uh, target space world sheet to the four dimensional direction. I'm focusing on this direction where degrees of freedom where, which maps the Riemann surface into Calabi-Yau part. So this is uh, very, uh, the very beginning uh, of the setup for, to describe type two string in this setup, uh, in a case like that. However, there is one departure from that when we go, when we start constructing topological st string theory. That is that we are going to do the procedure called the topological twisting. Okay, so topological twisting is the following procedure. That initially uh, we started with n equal to theory with central uh, energy momentum tensor and the pair of uh, uh, supercharges. But now I'm going to change the definition of energy momentum tensor by adding a derivative of the R current. So this would change various things. In particular, for example, this would change the conformal charges, conformal dimension of various operator in the system. So for example, initially, well, we had these two supercharges, G plus and supercurrent, G plus and G minus. Supercurrent has dimension three half on the world sheet. It has the same dimension as gravitino. 
So initially, G plus, for example, had conformal dimension three half for the left mover and zero for the right mover. But this G operator G is charged with charge one with respect to this current. So if you make this deformation, then this dimension gets changed from three half to one zero. Namely, G plus behaves just like the ordinary current on the target space. G dimension of G minus changes in the opposite direction because it is charged with opposite charge. So initially, it had the same dimension, three half and zero, but now it is going to be changed to two and zero. The dimension of the energy momentum tensor does not change. That is that dimension is going to be two zero, which continues to be two zero. So, so these are now the uh, uh, new conformal dimension of the generator. Now you may ask what are we doing here? That uh, we are not, of course, uh, are allowed to change the energy momentum tensor arbitrarily. Once you, somebody gives you the theory, namely, the, for example, the action on the world sheet. I realize I'm a little bit short, so I have to lower this. So suppose we have the action on the world sheet theory, then energy momentum tensor is automatically given by taking variation of say, for example, if we want to understand the energy momentum tensor for GG component, then we know that automatically by taking variation with respect to the metric, that's one definition of the energy momentum tensor. So we shouldn't have this kind of freedom to arbitrarily change the definition of energy momentum tensor. In fact, therefore, this amount, this kind of topological twisting must mean that we are changing the action also. In fact, it is so. So there is another way to talk about topological twisting. which is equivalent to the topological twisting I mentioned over there, which is that, that we are going to do the following. So I said that we have a current on the world sheet J and J bar. So suppose we are going to change the action by introducing the possibility of coupling this current with some gauge field A. So this is of course integrated over Riemann surface and A is some current, okay? So J, so we have, suppose we have holomorphic coordinate Z on the world sheet. J is a Z component. A bar is a Z bar component of the gauge field. And in particular, I choose this gauge field A bar to be minus one half times I times the spin connection. So omega is a spin connection. I guess I should should write it a little bit below. So A is equal to one half of omega, where omega is a spin connection. Basically analog of the Christopher, Christopher connection when it is acting on the spinner field. Okay? So so now spin connection depends on the metric because the way you define spin connection is that you start with a metric and then you introduce ein bein, pair bein, and then from that uh, you, take the, you take derivative and define the spin connection. So it, de it, it depends, it, it is depend on the metric. So therefore if you try to define the energy momentum tensor by taking variation of the action with respect to the metric, then this part will give you the original energy momentum tensor this part will modify the energy momentum tensor. And in fact, one can show that this part modifies exactly in such a way that that generates this uh, uh, deformation, namely that variation of this term 
with respect to the energy momentum tensor essentially generate one half of the derivative of j. So that uh, this is going to do the twisting. Okay? Yes? Yeah, so I'm coming to that point. But so here I'm telling you, so since this, is, this looks a little bit arbitrary, so I'm explaining another equivalent way of doing topological twisting, which is to modify the action by adding this term. So this is equivalent thing. This would amount to this thing. Now then you can ask why this is a natural thing to do. And that will be the subject of my third lecture. That is that if we want to connect the topological string theory computation, topological string computation to physical superstring computation, then you are naturally led to introduce this kind of twisting. So, 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 for, 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 so, so we'll, 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 we'll see such connection later. But for the purpose of this lecture today, you can think of this as the action of topological worldship theory of topological string. So this is something that is given, and this is what we are going to analyze. Yes. That's, that's coming now. OK? Sorry? Well, this does change the algebra, that's this, but this does not break the conformality. Yes. Well, so, so. It is a spin connection on the world. Thank you very much for clarifying question. Indeed, this J omega is a spin connection on the world sheet with respect to the metric on the world sheet. This is the world sheet metric. Ome om spin connection is a spin connection on the world sheet. It satisfies the standard uh, 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 moya kauta equation or whatever the equation. Yes. Now, uh, so, well, it requires some computation to actually verify that variation of this term with respect to metric indeed give rise to this. And this is going to be your first program. I understand that, uh, 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 so how, how do you call it, exercise program? So th I understand there is going to be a program solving session and so this is your first exercise. Namely, start with the def this definition, take a variation, and verify that adding this term exactly produces the topological twisting. Okay? Now, so the question then is why is this naturally called the topological? What's so topological about that? So I'm coming to that question. Okay. So now we see that with this variation, first of all, G plus becomes the dimension, acquired dimension of the current. So if you have a current, then it's natural to integrate it on some one-dimensional cycle. So for example, if you have a Riemann surface, well, there are various cycles that you can draw on the Riemann surface. I just realized that I put some colored chalk on the ridges of the blackboard, but now it's it went up, so I don't have an access to that. So I have to. <laughs> that, I think that's why they ha you have a box over here. I was too silly to not to notice that. Uh, so for example, you can draw this kind of a cycle. And then you can consider integrating this G plus current on the circle, right? So, so if you have a current, and then if you can integrate that over one dimensional cycle, then it gives rise to charge. So let's call this charge as Q. And for the reason that will become clear, I call that as QBRST. And the reason that this is called QBRST is clear uh, from the following reason. Well, the, uh, from the symmetry of the n equal to superconformal algebra, one can show two equalities. One is that this QBRST operator is nilpotent. And another identity is that this new energy momentum tensor, which 
is related to this old energy momentum tensor by the twisting can now be written as commutator or anti-commutator of this BRS, BRST operator with anti-ghost. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to derive this, but it can, be, it can follow immediately from this construction. Uh, we can discuss that at exercise session if you want to follow up on it. But in view of the time, I'm, I'm, just going to I'm just telling you that this is something you can derive from this uh, uh, superconformal algebra. So from this, we learn two things. One is that you have this nilpotent symmetry. So it is natural to introduce cohomology in your Hilbert space. Uh, this is just like BRS symmetry of BRST symmetry of gauge theory, that there you define physical state as cohomology of this BRST operator. And you regard everything that is BRST trivial as unphysical. So suppose you treat this BRST operator in the same fashion in this theory, then one thing we see immediately from this algebra is that this new energy momentum tensor itself is BRST trivial. Energy momentum tensor becomes BRST trivial after doing the topological twisting. Now, energy momentum tensor has to do with the variation of the theory with respect to the metric. So that means that if the energy momentum tensor is BRST trivial and therefore unphysical, that means that when you vary the Walsh theory with respect to the metric, it is an unphysical variation. So physical computation in your theory should not depend on the uh, variation of the metric, which is why it is called topological to answer your question. That is that you have some computation on the worksheet you can do, where in order to do the uh, field theory computation, you have to introduce metric, because otherwise you can't write Lagrangian. But it turns out that if you do the physical computation, physical in the sense of this BRC operator, then all the physical computation becomes independent of the metric. So that means that you can infinitesimally modify the metric or the geometry. It, the computation will not change. That's why it is called topological. Okay? And so I have told you that there are two ways to understand this procedure. One is to change the definition of the superconformal generator by doing this twisting procedure. But another is to add to deform this Walsh theory by adding term linear to the current. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. Ah, okay. So uh, there is no reason for that. So I'm just. This is just my definition of the theory. So I'm declare by fiat that I'm just going to con consider a uh, 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 subspace, cohomology of the Hilbert, Hilbert space, which is defined by this nilpotent operator. And uh, so this is what usually is done in uh, gauge theory quantization. For example, if you have taken course on uh, quantization of gauge theory in graduate course, for example, uh, well, for example, in QCD or Q, uh, uh, yeah, mirror theory or QCD, for example, you have a gauge symmetry. And uh, you have to set up so that uh, two co configurations that are gauge equivalent should be f regarded as physically equivalent, right? BRC, op you introduce, BR introduce you, uh, when you do the gauge fixing in covariant way, you introduce ghost and anti-ghost. And then BRC operator, so that physical Hilbert space is defined as cohomology with respect to this BRST operator. You can also introduce BRST operator in this way also. I'm not going to talk about that. But you can also introduce some gauge symmetry, and you can define BRST operator as a result of gauge fixing. One thing that you can say is that the Hilbert space, before you do this, uh, 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 require the cohomology condition, uh, the, the BRST condition then the Hilbert space would, ha would be uh, a positive indefinite. It's, it's not unitary. You can see that because that I'm this topological twisting breaks the spin statistic condition. That is that 
uh, G plus and G minus must be fermion. But uh, if after topological twisting, they are uh, have carrying some integer spin. So that means that spin statistics should be broken, so something should go wrong. And one thing that's go wrong is that if you do the topological twisting, then Hilbert space becomes not positive definite anymore. But if you introduce, BR, if you consider BRC cohomology, that subspace is positive has carries positive definite in that place. Okay. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's something that I do not have time to discuss during this lecture, but we can certainly talk about that at that exercise session. You can derive BRST oper this operator as the result of a gauge fixing of some symmetry. In fact, yeah, in fact, maybe if you let me continue toward the second half of this lecture, we will come, we will get some hint on what is the symmetry whose gauge fixing generates this BRST operator. Okay? Yes. Oh, this is an identity. And I, I say that I, I, will derive, I can derive that at the exercise session, but not now. This is something that uh, uh, you can, but basically, the, if you compute the operator product expansion of this, then it, it will contain a term like this. So therefore, if you consider uh, BRST operator as defined as contour integral of G plus, then this follows. So this follows from this kind of operator product expansion. Thank you very much for pointing that out. That was an error. Otherwise, it would be zero. G plus square would be zero. So it's G minus. Any other question? Right, you can do that too. So, so in, in that case, you have to twist in opposite direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. So actually, that's a very important point because that would lead to the notion of mirror symmetry later. Okay, so now so far, uh, I haven't told you why we should choose uh, a carabial manifold in this case. One important reason is that, well, first of all, uh, M, the target space, has to be carabial for superconformal symmetry. If you choose target space to be arbitrary manifold, then Walsh's theory would not be conformal invariant. So for example, the beta function. Uh, for the variation of the metric with respect to the uh, target space metric with respect to the cutoff. Well, if you consider sigma model, then the metric in the target space would be cutoff dependent. You have to re regularize and renormalize it in order to have a finite computation. And uh, so that would not be uh, 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 zero. In general, it is proportional to the rich curvature. And then some higher order term. And you can essentially set that to equal to zero if you choose a target space to be carabial. So therefore, uh, 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 if, uh, that is one requirement that the, we have to choose a target space to, to be carabial manifold. So uh, I would like to tell you a few things about the geometry of carabial manifold uh, in order to uh, uh, proceed and discuss uh, uh, topological string theory. So let me take maybe five minutes or so uh, discussing geometry of Karabia manifold. Okay? So first of all, it is a complex manifold. So that means that we can choose complex coordinate, holomorphic coordinate throughout the manifold. 
that if you have a Riemannian manifold, you can divide the manifold into various coordinate patches. And in each coordinate patch, you can map that region into a set of coordinates in Euclidean space. Here, we have possibility of introducing holomorphic coordinates. And in particular, if you go from one coordinate to patch to another coordinate patch, then the change of the coordinate can be done by holomorphic function. Now, this is not always possible. You cannot always do that for any uh, uh, manifold. But for Calabria manifold, you can do that. And another, uh, another property of Calabria manifold is that it is a Kähler manifold. Kähler means that uh, the metric component has particular property. Since I'm introducing complex coordinate, so I can write down the metric in using this complex coordinate, holomorphic coordinate. So the metric may have complex holomorphic holomorphic component or anti-holomorphic anti-holomorphic coordinate component or a mixed component. You can have these three possibilities. Kera means that these two, two components, two types of components are equal to zero. And well, these two conditions alone would just mean that metric be Hermitian, so-called. But the third condition is that this mixed component can be written as derivative with respect to some function k. And this k is called the Kähler potential. So, Understanding Kera metric is the same as understanding this Kera potential. It turns out that Kera potential cannot be globally defined function on the manifold because metric is written as del del bar of K and it is a simple computation to show that if K were globally defined function, then the volume of the manifold should be zero. So you get to into all kinds of contra uh, contradiction. So, in fact, k is not globally defined, but changes in certain way as you go from one coordinate patch to another coordinate patch. But it's still some important function. And finally, in order for the manifold to be called rich, uh, uh, Calabria manifold, it has to be such that its rich tensor, Rij bar, has to be equal to zero. If we have a manifold to begin with, the only interesting rich tensor is this mixed component, Rij, Ri, uh, Rij bar. Holomorphic, holomorphic component of rich tensor or anti-holomorphic, anti-holomorphic component of rich tensor vanishes. So this is the only interesting component. And moreover, if you have a, if you have a Kähler manifold, it is a simple algebra to show that its rich tensor is given by derivative of log of determinant of the metric. So it has a very, this kind of simple expression. So rich flat means that this is equal to zero. Somebody raise some voice, right? Okay, you say something? Okay, now, we can, we can try to solve this equation, but this equation is actually easy to solve because you have some function and del and del bar is equal to zero. So only solution to this equation should be log of determinant of G is equal to some holomorphic function and its complex conjugation. This would be a general solution to this equation. So that means that the determinant of G has to be called to product of some holomorphic function and uh, anti-holomorphic function. And let me write it as omega of X and omega bar of X bar. So that means that uh, if you have a rich flat Kähler manifold, then the determinant of G has to be 
product of some holomorphic object and its complex conjugation. Now let's try to see how these things transform under change of coordinates. Well, the left hand side is a well defined tensor. It's a top form. So for example, if you have a complex n dimensional manifold or a real two n dimensional manifold, then this would have in index one i1 to i n and j1 bar to j n bar because you are taking determinant of the metric. Each determinant has i and j bar component. In order to compute the determinant of that, I take product of n of them and then totally unsymmetrized with respect to the indices. So that means that these indices are totally unsymmetrized. You have n holomorphic indices and n bar anti-holomorphic indices, they are mixed with each other. Under change of coordinate, co holomorphic coordinate transform into holomorphic ones, and the anti-holomorphic one transformed into anti-holomorphic one. So that means that if you have holomorphic object, this has to be anti-symmetric n form, and this has to be anti-symmetric in bar form, the, the totally, uh, totally anti-symmetric, anti-holomorphic form. Namely, omega has to be holomorphic in zero form. And omega bar is a complex conjugation. That follows from the transform com uh, consistency of this equation, which we can derive from rich flatness condition. So we can see that if you have rich flat Kähler manifold, then there must be holomorphic n zero form. And this holomorphic n zero form must also not be zero because determinant cannot be zero. The metric should not be, non, should not be degenerate. It is a great theorem by Yao that the converse is also true. That is that if we, there is a non-zero holomorphic top form, n zero form, I'm considering n dimensional manifold, it implies that you can always solve this differential equation. Well, I said differential equation because you can, all, you can think of this as nonlinear partial differential equation for the Kähler potential. So what Yao proved is a hard analy analysis theorem that says that if this condition is met, then this nonlinear partial differential equation has a unique solution. So Yao's proof of Karabi conjecture says that the existence of holomorphic n form is equivalent that you have a solution to this equation. Okay? Any question? Hmm? K is, this is the definition of K. K are condition uh, guarantees for you that uh, you have this function. We don't know that function. De de depending on the Kähler manifold, you have different choice of k. Yeah, but, uh, is there no. <laughs> so, uh, so that that's what I said. So, so in fact, so so if you have holomorphic three form, then basically you need to solve this equation, right? Omega has a very nice expression. For example, in specific example, like, so later, I think if we ever get there, we'll have a ex various example of Karabiao, like Quintic and things like that. And uh, so Omega has a very explicit expression. Finding K is a very tough problem. So this is why I said that uh, the explicit form of the metric is not known. Okay, so any question, any other question while I'm trying to bring this blackboard up and down? Yes, please. No, because the, uh, uh, in fact, the equation I'm writing over there is a tensor equation because metric has, metric is two tensor, right? So if you try to define uh, determinant, you take n product of metric and unsymmetrize the indices. So determinant of n metric is actually n n form.
Okay. So now let's go into a little bit more explicit detail of how this uh, field theory, conformal field theory, look like. So like I said, I start with the variable where, where if x is a map from sigma to Calabria manifold, I'm going to use holomorphic coordinate, and then you have also fermion. Okay? So let me write down, so here I have this uh, super conformal generators, but let me write down the explicit forms. So G plus is going to be the metric multiplied by psi i del of x j bar, where del is with derivative with respect to the world sheet co holomorphic coordinate z. And then G minus is G i j bar psi j bar del of x i, and j is uh, uh, G i j bar psi i psi j bar, okay? So initially, fermion is dimension half zero operator for the left mover because it's a spinner. In the NSR formalism, the fermion on the wall sheet is a spinner, so it has sp dimension one zero, and x is, of course, dimension uh, uh, zero zero. But after twisting, after the twisting, I saw over there, uh, over here, sorry, that this now has dimension one zero, and this now has dimension two zero. So that means that, well, so this is already one form. So that means that uh, this component of the, uh, metric, uh, the, the fermion, psi bar, uh, please excuse me. I'm so I say that this is dimension one zero, this is dimension two zero over here, so I'm looking at this assignment. So this is already current, so that means that now after twisting, this holomorphic component of the fermion has to have dimension zero zero. And uh, psi i bar has to have dimension one zero. So they are no more spinner, but they transform differently under change of the coordinate of the world sheet. And then we have the, uh, I guess I have to, Then we have the BRST operator. Hmm? No, that's not the way to use it. Uh, now we have the BRST operator, uh, which is defined to be integral of G plus and uh, also integral of G bar plus because you have both left mover and right mover. So with respect to this uh, explicit form, let's try to compute the action of this BRST operator on the fundamental field psi and x. So uh, let's start with the action on psi i, uh, the xi coordinate. Well, uh, since BRST operator is fermionic, so let me introduce some Grassmannian parameter epsilon to keep track of the tran infinitesimal transformation. And then BRST. And then try to see how this transforms with respect to x. Well, so you have a derivative of x over here in G plus. So therefore, if I, compute, if I take this commutation relation, then you find that this is equal to epsilon of psi i. And similarly, del of x i bar transforms into epsilon 
of sine i bar of the right measure. Can you read that? I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not erasing the blackboard carefully enough. Uh, what should I do, actually? I'm explain. Okay, so uh, the other component is transformed like epsilon psi bar i bar. Okay, and then I should also write down how other components, other things transform. So fermion psi i bar would transform into epsilon of del of x i bar, and then fermion of psi i of the right mover would transform into this way. Now, I, the handouts that uh, I think that you, you must have gotten, I have explicit form of this transformation property. So if you cannot read this one, you should consult that. Okay, so, so this tells you two things. One is that under BRC transformation, X transforms into Psi. So if you, if you remember the, uh, uh, your lecture on quantization of gauge theory that some of you must have taken, then uh, you see that the BRC transformation is like gauge transformation, except that gauge transformation parameter is replaced by, uh, by a ghost field. So if you compare that with this, you can see that now, your fermion psi are like ghost field for the BRST operator. But gauge symmetry you are quantizing is actually transformation of shifting the coordinate. So namely that this, this theory has a symmetry that you can actually shift the uh, target space coordinate by any amount you like. Okay? And this is, uh, 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 so from that point of view, this is like anti-ghost field, and anti-ghost transforms into X, like this. So now you can ask, what is a BRST invariant configuration? So uh, if, you are in the, if you are interested in, for example, quantization of gauge field, you would ask, you would introduce uh, anti-ghost, ghost, and then define BRST operator. And you can uh, physical state as a state that is preserved by the BRST transformation. So what are the configurations that are preserved under gauge and BRST transformation? Well, the configurations that are preserved are the ones that all the BRST transforms are equal to zero. So this in particular means that this has to be zero. This has to be zero. So that means that BRST invariant configuration has to be such that uh, del of x i bar is equal to zero, or del and del bar of x i is equal to zero. Namely, it must be a holomorphic map from Riemann surface to the target space. So we learn from this uh, analysis that uh, the BRC configuration of this topological string must be holomorphic. Uh, oops. Sorry? So uh, psi, well, so, so in order for the x to be BRC invariant, psi has to be zero. That's a requirement. But psi is a Grassmannian field, so, so you, I mean, it doesn't mean very much. But what's important is that bosonic variables satisfy this condition. OK. Sorry? Hmm? 
So worship metric so far is not dynamical. So, so I just fix arbitrary metric, but since it is, uh, 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 the, the energy momentum tensor is uh, BRC trivial, so we don't worry about the dependence on the worship metric. That's what we mean by dealing with topological field theory. Okay. Now, so, So this is actually uh, one way to define uh, a topological string, but somebody pointed out, you pointed out, that there must be another way to twist the theory. So I said that uh, we have one way of twisting it, which is to define, and then uh, an uh, anti-holomorphic component in this way. But of course, if you look at uh, a superconformal algebra, there is an automorphism of the algebra, which exchanges g plus and g minus, and changing j to minus j. So that means that uh, we may be able to do some other twisting by changing sign. So you can see that there must be four different ways of doing it, because we have two so choice of signs here, and two choice of signs here. But actually, two of them are complex conjugation of the other one. So that does not give rise to interesting chain. But there is one interesting change, which is to change the relative sign of this thing. So, in fact, uh, this way of doing the ch uh, shifting is called A model. So, in fact, the twisting that I discussed so far correspond to what is called topological A model. And then there is things called the B model. which correspond to uh, a different way of uh, twisting that I'm going to change the sign here to minus, where here I have a plus sign. And, uh, but for anti-holomorphic component, I twist in the same way. So this is called the B model. So naturally, in this notation, the BRST operator is not integral of G plus and G bar plus, but it's going to be integral of G minus and G bar plus. Because now it is G minus operator that becomes dimension one. And also, the psi i bar and psi bar i bar becomes dimension zero, zero fermion, and the other one becomes the dimension one, zero, and zero, one operator. The BRC transformation properties also changes. In the case of B model, as opposed to the A model that we have over there, the Psi i, so xi do not transform under coordinate trans uh, under BRC transformation, but psi i bar transforms into psi i bar plus psi bar of i bar, and uh, the fermions transforms into derivative of x in this way. Now, this looks like a very small difference uh, from the, compared to the A model situation, uh, but actually the, its consequence is rather great. Because for example, if you ask what are the BRST invariant con configuration, then previously the configuration was such that del of x bar 
and del bar of x has to be equal to zero. Here, with this different twisting, the condition has to be such that del of x has to be zero, and del bar of the same x has to be equal to zero. Namely, del of x is zero, del bar of x is equal to zero. The only solution to this equation is that x is constant. So, in the case of A model, BRC invariant configuration corresponds to holomorphic map from Riemann surface to target space. But now we see that in the case of B model, BRC invariant configuration has to be a constant map. So it's much stronger condition, actually. So B model is simpler than A model. Because here, we are just dealing with constant map. So rather than considering most general map from Riemann surface to target space, in B model, you deal with just constant map that entire Riemann surface get mapped to a point in Calabrian space. Whereas here, we are dealing with holomorphic map. The space of holomorphic map is still much smaller than general map from Riemann surface to Calabrian manifold. General map will be infinite dimensional. This will be finite dimensional. Well, this is even simpler. Okay. So anyway, so you can essentially have these two different type of topological twisting. There are two others that you can think of, but those are complex conjugation of the other one. So they do not give rise to interesting twisting. Now there is a notion of mirror symmetry. So there is a thing called, yes, you have a question. You can certainly consider any Riemann surface mapped into a point in Calabrian manifold. In fact, you can, well, if you allow me to consider arbitrary map, then you can certainly map Riemann surface into Calabrian manifold. You can certainly consider actually infinitely many maps like that. Holomorphic maps are rare. And I'm going to tell you about a way to count them during the course of this lecture. So there is a notion of mirror pair of Calabria manifold, which is a very important notion. And uh, so it is a pair of manifold M and W. Both of them are Calabria manifold. But in general, different one. And it is such that A model on M is equivalent as a quantum field theory to B model on W. It's surprising that such pair exists. That means that uh, the counting of holomorphic map from Riemann surface to the manifold M should be the same as counting constant map from Riemann surface to W. But such examples are known and uh, has been of great use in doing computations in A model and B model. Uh, let's see, so I have these. Okay, so now next I would like to discuss uh, the physical observables and the formation of these spaces. Yeah, so finding them is an interesting question. So, so we all, we, I'm going to actually give you a systematic way of finding them in the next lecture. Sorry? To, so, so I have, I will give you a family example of M for which we can find W. So there is, so for certain class of M, there is a procedure of finding W known. General story is not known. In fact, uh, there are various puzzles and paradoxes. So for example, there are some class of Calabria manifold for which we do not know how to construct W, for example. So there are still some puzzles about that. But 
I'm going to tell you some example of the mirror pair of M and W in the next lecture. Okay, so how am I doing my, with my time? Looks like I'm doing my time terribly. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so let me, uh, about, however, I have to tell you about BRC cohomology. Okay, so I say that energy momentum tensor is the BRC transform of something else. So that means that if you are interested in finding a BRST uh, uh, invariant object, first of all, the dimension of the object has to be zero because otherwise it's not invariant under energy momentum tensor. So therefore, it's not BRST trivial, BRST invariant. So that means that in the case of A model, we have to use psi i and psi bar i bar because those are dimension zero zero operators. Well, but I'm thinking about when we talk about quantizing the system, we always consider Hamiltonian picture where we are considering the world series theory. So, so you have a Hilbert space defined on the circle and then you have a time going in this direction. Right? So, so, so then the cycle that I'm considering is this. So I'm defining BRC operator by integrating Yeah, but for each cycle, we have a Hilbert space flowing, right? So you have a, suppose you have a Riemann surface like that. Then, then we have a cycle like that. So that means that you have a Hilbert space propagating in this direction. So then I'm focusing on this direction. So for each Hilbert space, well, there is a unique choice of BRST operator. So when we classify, so, so, so then there is a state operator correspondence that is that if uh, in the conformal field theory, considering quantization of state on a circle is the same as considering a point and the consider classifying operator on that point. And then Hamiltonian, the Hilbert space is defined radially by treating the dilatation around this point as a, Hilbert, uh, as a Hamiltonian. So I'm going to take that point of view to classify the operator, okay? So in the case of A model, uh, we can see that uh, the operate, uh, ph physical operator has to take this kind of form. Namely, I choose holomorphic psi for the left mover, anti-holomorphic psi bar for the right mover because these are dimension zero operators. In general, consider arbitrary function of x multiplying to it. So this is ri just like considering PQ form in the target space if we identify psi i as uh, some kind of differential. So then you can see that uh, in that case, the BRST operator acts like exterior derivative operator uh, on them. Namely, that uh, QBRST is acting on them just like exterior derivative operator. So therefore, BRST cohomology is nothing but uh, the Hodge drum cohomology of the Carabial manifold that we are considering. Where this is a cohomology with respect to D with the P and Q form. The situation in 
The B model is a bit different. In the case of B model, the transformation is such that X bar transforms like this. But X is invariant. So that means that BRC operator is acting on some kind of differential form in question, but not as exterior derivative operator, but as a D bar operator. Because only anti-holomorphic coordinate is changed, but not holomorphic coordinate. And in fact, one can show that uh, BRC cohomology in this case is a similar object, but basically del bar cohomology. And uh, uh, we, it involves some tensor product, unsymmetric tensor product of the target space, uh, trans target space, uh, 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 tangent spaces. So uh, unfortunately, in view of the time, I, I cannot go into much detail. But you can essentially repeat the analysis to arrive at this. The detail is written on the lecture notes, so you should consult on that. So uh, if you have classified this kind of physical operator, we can start to talk about uh, uh, deformation of uh, topological string theory. Deformation, I mean the following. So uh, I said that the Carabial manifold is a complex manifold. And uh, in fact, Yao's theorem says that uh, for each complex manifold uh, with given holomorphic three form, uh, you can construct the Carabial metric. But in fact, uh, there, are, there will be a family of Carabial manifold because, for example, you can deform the complex structure of Carabial manifold. And then you get new Carabial manifold. So that means that you get new kind of topological string theory. So then it is interesting to try to understand what are the possible family of Carabial manifold. What are the possible deformation of this topological string theory? So that can be understood as follows. So let me discuss the deformation in the context of A model. So uh, in the case of A model, I said that physical states are PQ drum, uh, Hodge drum cohomology. So among them is one one form. So let's call this. So let's call the uh, target space to be M. So it is a one one form. So we can write it in this way. And then in general, there are several of them. So let's just choose some basis. So A goes from 1 to H11, which is a dimension of this H11. So there are several of such, such one forms. So for each of this one form, we can define an operator which is kij bar times psi i, psi bar, j bar. So this is a physical operator in the conformal field theory. So if you have that, well, we can act g minus 1, g bar minus 1 on phi of a to obtain an operator like this. And 
what you can do is to add this operator to the Lagrangian to deform the theory while preserving the conformal invariance and topological symmetry. So what you can do is suppose you have, a, you have an action. Then you can change the action by adding a linear combination of these. You can show that this preserves the topological symmetry. And to see that, uh, we just need to note the following fact. So for example, suppose I try to com commute VRST operator with this operator, G minus, G bar minus. What's gonna happen? Well, VRST operator, of course, commute with this phi operator because this is physical. So the only thing you should worry about is a commutator BRC operator with G minus. But we know that commutator of BRC operator with G minus has to be equal to the energy momentum tensor. So that means that commutator would generate the derivative of G bar minus with phi of A. So that means that if you commute this deformation with BRST operator, it becomes total derivative. So if the Riemann surface is closed without a boundary, then it, you can integrate that away. So therefore, in that sense, the variation of this new action is integral of total derivative of something. So that vanishes. So adding this kind of deformation preserves the topological BRC symmetry. Okay. Now, the only thing about this deformation that is that can potentially be a problem is that this is not a real Hamishan operator because complex conjugation of this will give you G plus, G plus, and pi bar. So in, in general, it is good in order to maintain the reality of the action it would be good to add complex conjugations of these two. So that is to add term like this. Namely the complex conjugation of this term. But this is actually BRST trivial. Another way to write it is this is, this is actually BRST commutator for the left mover and the right mover of phi bar of A. So therefore, adding this would not physically change the theory. Yes? Sorry? Ah, okay, so I was assuming that you had a course on conformal field theory last week, but evidently you did not, so I, I have to say a few things about this. So basically what it means in this particular situation is that G minus one minus acting on some conformal operator simply means that it's a contour integral of G minus around the point Z with this operator. And uh, G zero minus of phi of Z is similarly contour integral of G minus of W around Z. And uh, the only thing that, the only reason that I have minus one and zero is that in general when we do this operation, if you have an operator of dimension H, then if you want to do this operation, then I would write over here one minus H. So therefore, since G minus is operator of dimension two, so I'm just writing one minus two, which is minus one. Here, since G, G plus is of dimension one, so I'm just writing one minus one, which is zero. Okay. So that's sort of standard notation of conformal field theory. I, I'm sorry that you have not seen it last week.
So, but now I would like to note that uh, since this starts out with del x, del bar, x bar, as I wrote over here, and since this starts out with uh, del x, uh, in similar way, you can see that this starts out with del x bar and del of x. So you can write this to the formation as saying that it is equal to summation A of T A plus T bar A of uh, integral of K A of I J bar del x i del bar x j bar plus del x j bar del of x i plus some other terms. And then in addition, t a minus t a bar of k i j bar of a del x i del bar x j bar minus del x i del bar uh, del x j bar del i, del bar of x i, etc. So you can write this as sum and differences. And so let me highlight where the pluses and minuses are. So here is a plus, here is minus, here is plus, and here is minus. And probably I ignore to put one half sign somewhere. Uh, maybe I should put one half over here. Okay, so you can write this in this way. And the reason that it is useful to do this is the following. So let's see, so which one goes right? If you look at the first line, uh, in the right hand side over there, then you see that uh, the first line over there amounts to changing the metric gij bar by adding something like ta plus T A bar and K I J bar of A. So, so this, the first line amount to changing the metric by adding linear combination of one one form. So this does not change the complex structure because you are not mixing I and J bar. It, I'm preserving the complex structure but it's just modifying the metric tensor in this way. On the other hand, so if you look at second term, you see that it is coupling to unsymmetric component of del x and del bar x bar. So this is called Ramon Ramon, sorry, NSNS two form field. So it is as if you are turning on the B field, NSNS B field in the target space, by which is which whose amount is equal to T A minus T A bar times K I bar I J bar of A. So you see that uh, doing this particular deformation of A model corresponding correspond to changing the metric like that and introducing the uh, uh, B field. Now this type of deformation of the metric is called changing, changing of the Kähler class of the uh, uh, metric. The reason for that is the following. For each given metric, I can introduce what is called a Kähler form. And you can parameterize the metric by asking how you can write this as a linear combination of the element of H11. And if you choose a basis of H11, you can write this as a linear combination with respect to that basis 
and the coefficient of that is called the Kähler class. So therefore, this deformation, you can call this as changing of the Kähler class. And then, in addition, this deformation corresponding to turning on the BT. In physics literature, therefore, this T of A is called complexified Kähler moduli. Because it is changing the Kähler class, but in fact, uh, it has both real part and imaginary part, and the imaginary part corresponds to turning on the B field. Okay? So this is a, a deformation of the A model. Now, uh, deformation of the B model can be discussed in similar way, and in view of the time, I will not be able to cover that, but there, the Kähler class is preserved, but now complex structure is modified. So if you repeat the same thing, then you see that uh, 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 what is deformed by adding this kind of term in the case of B model is a deformation of the complex structure of Calabria manifold. So deformation of the A models, a deformation of Kähler structure, deformation of the B model is the deformation of the complex structure. And in fact, Yao's theorem says that for each given complex structure and Kähler class, there is a unique rich flat Kähler manifold. So therefore, the B model data and A model data combined uniquely specifies the Calabria manifold. Now, so, so far in this discussion, I considered the uh, general n-dimensional Calabria manifold. But let me end this lecture by explaining the fact that Calabria threefold is of particular importance. So, so this is kind of interesting from, because from the physics perspective, Calabria threefold is interesting, it's special. And uh, but in mathematics perspective, or from the perspective of topological string, again, Calabria threefold three is special. So it's kind of interesting to see that they go hand in hand. So, So this, is, this has to do with this topological twisting that uh, I mentioned earlier. So I said that uh, uh, topological twisting amounts to deforming the action by adding term like that. Okay? Now, but J is this fermionic current, and J is actually current consisting of the left mover, and J bar is for the right mover. So if you just take out the left moving part, then you can show that there is a chiral anomaly, because J is for the chiral component of the world heat fermion which is proportional to C hat, the central charge, and the field strength of the gauge field that couple to the current. So this is the standard. Now, if I choose A to be the spin connection, as I said, then you have the curvature for the current. If we choose the curvature to be spin connection, the curvature is nothing but the Riemann curvature, or scalar curvature, in this case. So that means that there is an anomaly for the current. So that gives rise to violation of the fermionic num fermion number. There is a violation. But total amount of the violation of fermion number 
is determined by the curvature of the world sheet. So in particular, the integral of the curvature of the world sheet is given by Euler number. So this is 2 minus 2g. So from this, you can show the total violation of fermion number is actually 3, uh, sorry, c hat times 1 minus g. Because uh, uh, the total amount of violation of fermion number is c hat, the central charge, times the curvature of the world sheet. So this means that uh, the amplitude you, you compute for topological string will be zero unless it, it, it saturates this number. So, Karabiao 3 is special since C hat is equal to dimension of the manifold, which is equal to 3. In that case, the total amount of violation is 3 minus 3g. So in order to saturate it, one way to do it is to insert operator g minus 3g minus 3 times and g bar minus 3g minus 3 times. So look like I just ran out of time. Uh, should I finish now? Perhaps. Okay, so in the next lecture, I will start with this point and explain how you can, so, so what I can say at the very end today is that because of this condition, in the case of Karabiao threefold, you can compute this particular type of correlation function on the Riemann surface. So in the next lecture, I will use this to define uh, the uh, topological string amplitude and then discuss various properties of it. Okay, thank you very much.